6% of Americans claim to be Christians. Christian meaning I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. Um, do you see a problem with that? <laughs> and by the way, 65%, that's still the majority. It's down. Uh, the Gallup poll showed in 2015 it was 75%. And I think about seven years before that it was like 85%. It's going down quick. But still, what a mess we're in as a, as a country. And yet 65, if, if 65% of this country actually believed the truth and lived as Christians ought to live, what a difference that would make. But the problem is that the majority of people who claim to follow Jesus are actually following a satanic counterfeit. That's the root problem. That's the sad reality. For example, Raphael Warnock up here in Atlanta, Ebenezer Baptist Church, claims to be a minister of Jesus Christ. That's what he claims. But I know for a fact that he and I are not serving the same Jesus Christ. Uh, the Lord Jesus Christ who, who has saved me and whom I'm, I serve, for an example, he's totally against abortion. I know that from his word. And on it goes. If you look at his doctrine, it's pretty scary. He's not a Bible believer. He's not preaching the truth. He's a minister of Satan, posing as a minister of Jesus Christ, and he's a corrupt politician. But I just thought I'd share that with you. Um, so that's, that's just the way it is. That's, that's where we're at in this country. And, and of the millions of people who are they're going to celebrate Christmas in just a few weeks, millions and millions and millions, most do not know who he is. They're going to talk about baby Jesus. You know. Why, who is he? Why did he come? They're, they're, they're ignorant of who he really is and why he came and the fact he's coming again. The world's not offended by baby Jesus. They don't care if you talk about Jesus in a manger. But if you say he's God manifest in the flesh, and you begin to tell the truth about who he is and why he came and the fact he's coming in wrath, they get pretty offended by that. So, hey, this Christmas when people talk about baby Jesus, don't leave him in the manger. And don't leave him on the cross either. He's risen. He's glorified. He's God Almighty. And I'm telling you that this is the issue. I was really thinking about when you really get to the root of things, what's really going on? So uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse number 1, Paul said, Would to God you could bear with me a little of my folly, and indeed bear with me. Now, I don't have time to elaborate too much on the context, but just simply to say, he's going to do some boasting here, and he does it reluctantly. He doesn't want to do it, but he's doing it sarcastically in response to the boasting of the false teachers that the church at Corinth was listening to. I am jealous over you with godly jealousy. Jealousy is not, if you, read it, if you study the word in the King James Bible, it's, it's usually used in, in, in the right sense of uh, the godly sense that you are jealous over what's rightfully yours. And God, his name is jealous, it says in Exodus chapter 34. He's a jealous God. He will not share his glory with any. When his people are serving idols, he's jealous over that because he deserves all the glory. He's God, the creator God, the Lord, the Savior. And so godly jealousy. We often think of jealousy as a sin, but it's not in the right context. I'm jealous over you with godly jealousy. He wasn't jealous for their love for him. He was jealous for their love for Christ. For I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. Now that's figurative language, of course. He also tells the church at Corinth he's their father. He told the Galatians he was their mother. I mean, this is figurative language to illustrate uh, his ministry. But the bottom line is chaste. That means pure. He wants to be able to present them as a ch as, see, figurative, as a chaste virgin to Christ. But here's the problem. But I fear, lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety. And of course, that was by casting doubt on God's word and getting them away from what God said. And you, look, you need to really study Genesis 3 because Satan uses those same tactics today. So your minds, and there's the battlefield in spiritual warfare. 
the mind. So your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. The simplicity in Christ is that our salvation is in Him, period. It's not Christ plus anything. It's Christ alone. His death, burial, and resurrection is how we're justified, sanctified, and glorified. In Colossians 2, he said you're complete in Him. Anything that comes along and tries to add is it's designed by Satan to corrupt your mind. We need to have our full confidence in Jesus Christ and Him alone. But he said your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. So you have the contrast, a chaste virgin or corrupted. God wants us pure in our doctrine and in our life, but Satan wants to corrupt us in our doctrine, which will ultimately corrupt us in our life because what you believe impacts how you behave, right? How does Satan do this? For if he that cometh preacheth another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or if you receive another spirit which you have not received, or another gospel which you have not accepted, you might well bear with him. So why are you putting up with these false teachers coming and preaching another Jesus, another spirit, another gospel? That's not what I preached unto you. Skip down to verse number 13. For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ, and no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed to an angel of light. Therefore, it's no great thing if his ministers... Satan has ministers that he uses. And, but you see, they pretend to be something else. It's no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. They may pretend to be righteous, but they're not. They're trusting in their flesh instead of the Lord, and destruction awaits. Now, Satan is to be dreaded as a lion. He can be as a roaring lion walking about seeking whom he may devour, 1 Peter 5, 8. He's to be dreaded as a lion. He's to be more dreaded as a serpent, though. But even more so as an angel of light. Now, I'm telling you, the religious world's been deceived. Most people in religion today are in Satan's mystery of iniquity and don't even know it. That's the power of deception. So... The name Jesus means Savior. Matthew 1, 21, he, She shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Jesus is Savior. Acts 4, 12, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men, talking about the Lord Jesus Christ, whereby we must be saved. Jesus Christ is the Savior, the only Savior, and I think that all people know deep down they need a Savior. People know they're not right. People know they've sinned. People have a conscience. They can sear their conscience and, and go way off into left field and, uh, and, and, and plunge themselves into even further darkness. But, but people initially, they, they realize they realize something's not right, that God is real, and there's, there, there's a problem, and they need a Savior. The last thing that Satan wants is for sinners to trust in Jesus Christ as their Savior. That's the last thing he wants, is for them to know who the real Savior is. Satan is evil, but he's very wise. When he fell, he did not lose his wisdom. He corrupted it. Lucifer was a very wise being, a very beautiful being. He was the anointed cherub covering the throne of God. When he fell... He corrupted his wisdom. He didn't lose his wisdom. And so he's too wise. He is too wise to deny that Jesus is real. Only a few foolish people out there would fall for that. So what does he do? He promotes a counterfeit Jesus instead. He offers a counterfeit. And he's the master counterfeiter. Because why? He's a great deceiver. And one of the greatest ways to deceive is through counterfeit. And so Satan has another Jesus. That takes on different forms depending on who he's trying to appeal to. But he, he has another Jesus, and he has another gospel, and he has another spirit, and he has another Bible, and he has another church. He counterfeits the whole thing. And I'm focusing in this morning on Jesus. We could do a whole series on this stuff about another spirit and another gospel and all. But we're talking about another Jesus this morning. And Satan is in religion. All religion in this age of grace is of the devil. Every bit of it. 
And it's called the mystery of iniquity. Paul talked about that in 2 Thessalonians 2. And that is iniquity in the form of religion. That's as Paul said in 2 Timothy 3, when they have a form of godliness, but deny the power thereof. The power of godliness is being one in the body of Christ, being made godly in Him. But the religious world is going about trying to be godly in their flesh. And they're trusting in the flesh. That's what Satan wants. He wants you to trust in your own flesh and not the Lord. Sadly, he's very successful in what he does. Why is he so successful in what he does? Well, because most people are ignorant of the Word of God. That's just a fact. Most people are ignorant of the Word of God. I'm talking about people in church are ignorant of the Word of God. But most people are ignorant of the Word of God. Therefore, they, they don't have the spiritual discernment to tell another Jesus from the true Jesus Christ. Because you only get that discernment from the Spirit of God and the Word of God. Then, among those who claim to believe the Bible, you have this problem. Most of them won't study it God's way, the way He told you in 2 Timothy 2.15, and that's rightly dividing the Word of truth. And so what happens? They don't understand the difference between Christ and His earthly ministry to Israel and His heavenly ministry through the Apostle Paul to the Gentiles. They see no difference. They don't, they don't get that. And there's a lot of problems as a result. Not only that, there's coming a day after this age when the world is going to worship Satan. And when the world worships Satan, who do they think they're worshiping? Jesus Christ. You see, he's coming as the Antichrist. Anti doesn't just mean in opposition to, it means instead of. He's going to have a death, burial, and resurrection. You're talking about, he's counterfeit. He is a roaring lion, right? As a roaring lion. Well, who's Jesus Christ but the lion of the tribe of Judah? Counterfeit. So let me give you what I want to talk about just a little bit this morning, and that is, first of all, another Jesus. You have the unbiblical Jesus. But you have the non-dispensational Jesus. And then you have the diabolical Jesus. And what I mean by that is the Antichrist is Satan incarnate. Diabolical means possessed of the devil. Now, this is not the real Jesus. I'm talking about this is where we're at, and this is the root problem. There's nothing more important than having a true and spiritual knowledge of God. Nothing more important than that. Well, we can only know the true and living God through His Word, and Jesus Christ is the Word of God. Jesus Christ is called the Word with a capital W because He reveals and declares the Father. The Spirit of God inspired the Word of God for what purpose? To reveal and declare Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is central in all the Scriptures so that there is an inseparable bond between the incarnate Word, Jesus Christ, and the inspired Word, the Holy Scriptures. One is God manifest in the flesh, 1 Timothy 3.16. The other is God manifest in a book, 2 Timothy 3.16. And so all three members of the Godhead are equally God. One God and three persons, co-equal, co-eternal, Father, Son, and Spirit. But you know what? And I'm not running the references for time's sake, but God, look... The Son of God was sent to glorify the Father. And the Holy Ghost was sent to glorify the Son. And so the Holy Spirit who inspired the Scripture glorifies the Son of God who's central in all the Scriptures. You can't know God without the Word of God. You can't know God without Jesus Christ. Well, you can't know Jesus Christ without the Scripture. Don't you think the devil knows that? Which is why he has so many counterfeit Bibles out there that diminish Jesus Christ in his person and work. There's no way that the Holy Spirit is within 10 miles of a translation that, that takes away from the deity of Christ. There's no way the Holy Spirit had anything to do with the translation that calls Lucifer and Jesus by the same title like the NIV and the ESV and all the rest of them. I mean, there's no way. When you know the truth of it. All right. So let's say a word about the unbiblical Jesus, okay? And that is, there is a Jesus that exists in the minds of religious people that's totally foreign to the Scriptures. Totally foreign. But since they've been deceived into, you know, they don't believe the Bible's the inspired Word of God. Now, Satan wants to start there. He wants to start with you not believing this book is the authority. He wants you to doubt it. He wants you to question it. He doesn't want you to trust the Word of God. So whenever you don't believe the Word of God, you've opened yourself up to all manner of lies. 
right? And so there's a whole group out there in religion that will talk about Jesus, but they don't believe the Bible is the Word of God, which is ridiculous. I mean, how do you claim to know the Word of God when you don't believe the Word of God? <laughs> they go together, but because they don't believe the Bible is the Word of God, they pretend Jesus is whoever they want him to be. As in 2 Corinthians 10 verse 5 about spiritual warfare, uh, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Satan's after your mind, and there are people that have created a Jesus in their own image. They don't, they, in other words, God created us in his image, but you have religious people trying to create God in their own image. That's idolatry. There are people that talk about Jesus Christ that are idolaters because they have formulated in their own thinking another Jesus that they worship, not the true Jesus Christ. I'll give you a couple examples, give, give you an idea of what I'm talking about. This another Jesus, the unbiblical Jesus, is not God. See, when people start talking about Jesus Christ, now more than ever, you need to be specific and start asking them some questions about what they really believe about Jesus Christ. People say, I follow Jesus. I say, well, tell me about him. Let me ask you this, let me ask you that. You need to discern because there's a lot of people talking about Jesus. He's not the same Jesus of this Holy Bible because Jesus in the Bible is God. But this another Jesus in the religious world is not God. You know how many people in the Presbyterian Church, the Methodist Church, the Episcopalian, and blah, 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 don't even believe he's the virgin-born son of God? They don't believe he's God manifest in the flesh? They say, well, he was a good man and a good teacher, and we follow his moral example in, in all that. I, look, I can give you, I can stand here all day proving you Jesus is God from the Bible, but I'll give you some Christmas verses, okay? How about Isaiah 9, 6? For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. The child being born is his humanity, but the son being given is his deity because he left heaven to come to the earth uh, to be the king and, and, of course, to be our savior. The government shall be upon his shoulder and his name, this child that is born, what is his name? One, his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. You believe that? Micah 5, 2, But thou, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me, that is to be ruler in Israel. And who is this one that's going to be born in Bethlehem, whose goings forth have been from of old, from everlasting? Modern versions mess with that. Take that away. No, he's, he's the everlasting God, right? And so, Matthew 1, you know what it says. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise when as his mother Mary was espoused to Joseph before they came together. It's emphasized that she's a virgin. She was found with child of the Holy Ghost. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man, not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privately. But while he thought on these things, you understand, he's thinking, what in the world's going on? He doesn't, so he needs an angel to enlighten him. The angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Now all this was done, that it might be fulfilled, which is spoken by the Lord, by the prophet, saying, and this is from Isaiah 7, Behold, a virgin shall be with child and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel. Why? What does that mean? God with us. Then Joseph, being raised from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord had bidden him, took him to his wife, and knew her not till she brought forth her firstborn son and called his name Jesus. How about John chapter 1? In the beginning was the Word, capital W. And the Word was with God in the Godhead, Father, Son, and Spirit, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him. Without him was not anything made that was made. Who is that word? Well, verse 14, the word was made flesh, dwelt among us. We beheld his glory. The glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. No mere man can be full of grace and truth. He is God manifest in the flesh. Now, I can go through and show you where Jesus Christ made it clear. You know what he said to the Jews that were against him and, and not believing on him, and yet they, they, they you know, esteemed Abraham. You know. He said, before Abraham was, I am. That is a clear statement of him saying he's God Almighty. Before Abraham, he didn't begin in Bethlehem, he's the eternal God. Before Abraham was, I am. And there are many verses like that, and yet these liberals want to come along and say, well, he was a good man, and uh, he was a good teacher and philosopher, but he wasn't actually the Son of God. 
I got zero respect for people like that. Zero. Less than zero. I got a zero with the rim rubbed out. <laughs> Amount of respect for people talking about Jesus. They want to talk about Jesus. Don't believe who the Bible said he is. Fact of the matter is, and that this was some years ago, I can't remember the original one who came out with this, but they said, and it's been used many times, they say he's either the Lord, a liar, or a lunatic. He said he's the Lord, so if he's not, then he must be a liar. Or if he was sincere and said he was the Lord, but he's not, he must be a lunatic. You can't say he was a good man, but not the Son of God. Because if he's not the Son of God, he was a great deceiver. That's not a good man. No, the reality is he is the Lord. He proved himself to be the Lord in his words and in his works and what he accomplished. This Bible is clear. The evidence is in. Jesus Christ is God Almighty. But there's another Jesus in religion who, who doesn't believe that. They don't believe he was born of a virgin. They don't believe he's the Son of God. They don't believe he's God manifest in the flesh. And they also don't believe his blood saves. See, another Jesus in religion, his blood doesn't say. But we know without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sins. Hebrews 9.22. And what you have in religion, you've got many going in the way of Cain. What is the way of Cain in Jude 11? It's the bloodless way of being self-righteous and trying to earn your salvation, right? But you know what Jesus said to a very religious man in John 3? Jesus answered, said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus saith to him, how can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter a second time to his mother's womb and be born? See, he's thinking as a natural man. Jesus is talking spiritually. Jesus answered, verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. What does that mean? He interprets the next verse, that which is born of the flesh. That's born of water. That which is born of the flesh, your human birth, is flesh. But in the flesh, Jesus said, the flesh profiteth nothing. The flesh is corrupt. You can't possibly earn salvation by your flesh. Jesus Christ is clear on that. You need to be born again of the Spirit of God, God putting His life in you, God making you His child. That's not what you do, it's what He does. And so God does not accept the religion of the flesh. And by the way, I understand under the gospel of the kingdom they had to prove their faith. But it was faith. God never accepted the works of a man's flesh in any dispensation. And so he said, that which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I said unto thee, ye must be born again. Now, does that sound like an option? Okay. Ye must be born again. Now, what it, when Jesus said, ye must, how, it, how, can a, how can that even be possible? Well, there's another must in the passage. In verse 14, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. On what? The cross. That whosoever believe them should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believe them should not perish, but have everlasting life. Jesus Christ taught that a man cannot see the kingdom of God unless he's born of the Spirit. He did not accept the stinking works of the flesh. He took those Pharisees and nailed their hide to the wall for being hypocrites, for being self-righteous. He did not accept it. He rejected it. He cursed the fig tree, which represented Israel's self-righteous religion. Don't tell me that Jesus is going to accept the religious world. He does not. Nobody's going to see the kingdom of God unless they're born of the Spirit of God. And that's a work of God. That's not a work of the flesh. You see, His blood... His, he said, this is, when in that last supper, he said, this cup, what was it representing? The blood of the New Testament. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. And yet you have another Jesus who accepts people's religion. You better read your Bible again because the Jesus in this Bible didn't do that, did he? They had to have faith in God. Another Jesus is inclusive and ecumenical. Another Jesus. You got a, a Jesus out there that says, let's all just get along, you know. Let's all hold hands. We're all the same in the end. We're all working to go to the same place. And uh, you, you have another Jesus that is tolerant of all these uh, different groups out there that are preaching false messages. And uh, that's not the Jesus of the Bible. Jesus of the Bible said in Matthew 7, he said, enter ye at the straight gate. For wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. Many there be which go in thereat. 
because straight is the gate, narrow is the way, which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. Beware of false prophets, which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly there are ravening wolves. You shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? Well, obviously not. Even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. That sounds real tolerable, doesn't it? Wherefore, by their fruits you shall know them. Ecumenical, you know, just blend it all together. That doctrine doesn't matter, you know, just blend it all together. We're all, you know, you had, you had a guy like Billy Graham. Billy Graham was a compromiser his whole ministry. Don't give me this stuff about in the 50s. He was a great man of God. He yoked up with the Catholic Church in the 50s. Billy Graham never would have got the platform he had if he wasn't a massive compromiser. That's the truth. See, I like him. I don't care if you like him. I'm telling you the truth. He was an apostate compromiser. Now, God, if he gave some scripture, God can use it in spite of him, right? But I'm going to tell you what, that, you know what that man said before he died? He said, if a Muslim's sincere, he's going to the same heaven I am. He paved the road for a lot of people to think they're going to be okay as long as they're sincere. But there's a way which seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Your sincerity won't save you. You've got to sincerely believe the truth. And so uh, I remember when I was in Bible college, I preached at an assisted living chapel. And I got up and preached against Billy Graham. And I didn't think I was going to make it out of there alive. <laughs> and people wanted to stone me. But I said, I'm going to tell you the truth, you bunch of compromisers. <laughs> anyway, but it's sad. I don't say that with glee. I say it with sorrow. That's, but that's where, you know, this type of stuff that goes on, you know. You know, Rick Warren's of the devil. He's flat-footed of the devil. He wants to blend Christianity with Islam, call it Chrislam. I'm not kidding you. Purpose-driven life. You know what? That, when you're talking about a deceiver, he said it's not about you, right? That's what he said in the introduction of his book. The book it sold millions and millions and millions and millions and millions of copies. And he starts the book saying it's not about you, and the whole book is about you. Have some discernment, please. It's a self-centered, you know, psychological mumbo-jumbo type of a book. Say it would help people. I don't know why. It's not the truth. Have you ever read it? It's garbage. So I'm, that's what I'm talking about. And Jesus Christ said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. Is that what he said? Yeah, that's what he said in John 14, 6, and he means what he says. So you got another Jesus that's not God. His blood doesn't save. He's inclusive and ecumenical. And he's also liberal. And, and um, you know, he accepts abortion. It's just a woman's right, you know, and all that junk. Woman's right. Give me a break. Give me a break. This stuff about a woman. What about the baby's right? Life begins at conception, according to the scripture. Uh, you know, whenever Mary came in and spoke to her cousin Elizabeth, John the Baptist in her womb leapt for joy. How's a fetus do that, you know? Leaping for joy? Life begins at conception. God hates abortion. Abortion is murder. God is against the sodomites. His word is clear all the way through. It's an abomination. It hasn't changed in this age of grace. God hates sin as much as he ever has. Read what Paul said about it in Romans chapter 1. He called it vile affections. And he said that he taught in the passage the recompense is death. Read it. And so you got a Jesus now that's just accepting all this stuff. That's another Jesus. Jesus, the Bible doesn't accept it. Jesus Christ said, I'm the light of the world. Well, you know what? God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. He hadn't changed his mind about sin. He, he's just as holy as he's ever been. And he's not a liberal. And, and now, in the true sense of the biblical term, as far as being generous, yes. But as far as uh, concerning morality, uh, you, holiness and righteousness, all that's the same and so uh, for an example you know you got these liberals talking about the sermon on the mount they think it's they think the sermon on the mount is like this real sweet you know message where have you ever read that thing jesus said if you've heard you, you've heard it was said by them of old time thou shalt not commit adultery but i say unto you that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart and if thy right hand offend thee pluck it out 
Cast it from thee, for it's profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish, not that the whole body should be cast into hell. If thy right hand offend thee, cut it off. Cast it from thee, for it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish, and not that thy whole body should be cast into hell. It hath been said, Whosoever should put away his wife, let him give her a writing of divorcement. But I say unto you, Whosoever should put away his wife, saving for the cause of fornication, causeth her to commit adultery. And whosoever shall marry her that is divorced, committeth adultery. And yet they say, well, you know, and I think it was Obama who said years ago something about, about the same sex. And by the way, no such thing, no such thing as same sex marriage. Don't say that. No, that's not marriage. It's perversion, abomination, queer. There's a lot of terms you can use. Don't call it marriage. Obama said, you know, said something about, I follow the Sermon on the Mount, not an obscure passage in Romans. That's what he said. Well, ain't, uh, Romans 1 is not obscure. It's clear as day. Jesus Christ wouldn't even acknowledge the sodomites in the Sermon on the Mount. Marriage is a man and a woman. Amen. He wouldn't even give the sodomites the time of day. Just because he didn't get up and talk about it a lot. I, I am so sick of it, aren't you? It's like you can't, I mean, now it's so in your face. That, and look, they're not, they're, don't be deceived. They used to always say, we just want you to, you know, not mistreat us. And, you know, that's not what they want. They want to be elevated. They want to have rights ab above and beyond normal people. They want you to celebrate their, their perversity. That's what they want. They won't stop. In other words, they, they want to indoctrinate children because they can't reproduce, so they have to recruit. These are evil people. These are evil, wicked, vile people. Sodomites are disgusting. That's the truth. It's, 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 it is, and, and, and what do we have? Everybody wanting to water it down, you know. No excuse for it. No excuse for it in the Word of God. The Bible is very clear. It's against nature. You don't even have to be saved to know <laughs> what comes natural. So what that is is reprobate. That is... That's the ultimate spit in the face of God and, and reject, rejection of God. Read Romans 1 and see it's at the bottom of the barrel of depravity. It's not to be taken lightly. It's, it's a serious, serious offense. And you got preachers now saying, well, if they love each other. They don't love each other. What are you talking about? You, people are being brainwashed because they have another Jesus. That's okay with it, you know. I know y'all know this, but somebody's got to say this every once in a while because you're, you'd be surprised the preachers that are folding on this. You better hope the news don't ever put a video camera in my face and a microphone and ask me what I think about it because I'll tell them the absolute truth. I'll tell them the absolute truth about it. You're not helping people by lying to them. You're not helping people by watering it down. Look, we all deserve death and hell for our sins. The good news is Jesus died for our sins. But you've got to see yourself a lost sinner before you'll trust Christ as your Savior. And people need to feel the sting and the conviction of the Holy Ghost against their wickedness. But now the church is all about trying to make everybody comfortable with themselves. People say, I was born that way. That's like a bank robber saying, I can't help it. I was born to rob banks, you know. That's stupid nonsense is what that is. That is, that is ridiculous. That's unscientific. <laughs> As my preacher used to say years ago, I remember he'd say, I know they weren't born that way. If they had been born that way, they'd had different plumbing. Amen. <laughs> it's just that simple. It's just that simple. Now, because I care, I'm going to tell them the truth. You know what? If people are sincere and they want the truth, they're going to receive that, and they're not going to get offended by it. People get offended by this kind of preaching. I know why. <laughs> the truth is the truth. And by the way, read the Bible. Read the Bible. God has some strong things to say about sin. Now, I'm going to say this. People say, well, you, that's no different than any other. Yes, it is different. Not all sin is the same. All sin is sin. But God didn't give the death penalty on everything, did he? He gave it on that, didn't he? Did he? Is that a different God? No, it's the same God. Now, we're in the age of grace. We're in the age of grace. It's not the church's place to go out and execute sodomites or anything like that. No, we're going to tell people how to get saved, and that's our business, and that's our focus. But when you have churches now, that see, you see what happens is years ago, all the denominations knew it was wrong. Now, most of them think it's okay, and they even put them in leadership. They have the mainline denominations 
that have so-called ministers that are uh, queer. And they, and they let them be in the leadership of the church. Now, I, I use the word queer because it is strange, isn't it? Isn't it strange for a man to desire a man? That's mighty strange. That's sick. Same thing with a lesbian. It's just as sick. And, and it's, it's vile, and that's why we call it that. See, when you go homosexual, you know, use that. that that's not doesn't have a sting to it, you know? Gay. No, it ain't gay. Gay used to mean happy. That means you're dying with AIDS, I guess. I don't know what they think it means now. But it's, they, they hijack the word. And you know what I find? I do this on purpose. Yeah, I'm just testing you all out. So, so far, you're making it okay. <laughs> I say things as bluntly as I can on purpose because I, I, I like to separate the, the Bible believers from the fakers because there's a lot of people get mad when I preach like that. I'm not talking about in here. I'm just talking about in general because they claim to believe the Bible, but why are you tolerating what God calls an abomination? Now, I love them enough to tell them the truth. I'd like to see people get saved. If a, if a, if a sodomite is what I believe, if they've never heard the gospel, I think it's possible. They get confronted with the gospel, they get saved. I believe that. But some of them have heard it and rejected it, and they've gone reprobate, and you're not getting anywhere with them, you see. So you, you just got to give the word of God. Matthew 9, we'll finish here. I'm not preaching the whole message today. I knew I wouldn't. Matthew 19. We, and look, I started to say that they used to just say, oh, just accept us, but they've gone beyond that. Now they want to talk about they're a different gender and they want to, it, it is insanity. You give them, a, 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 look, a little leaven leavens the whole lump, right? That it spreads, it permeates, and so they're not satisfied. They, if we only really knew what they wanted to accomplish, it would blow our mind how wicked and vile. And... I can't even, I don't keep up with it. I don't want to keep up with it. But ain't no telling what's going on nowadays. You know, all these people, you know, with their gender nonsense. You know, there's no such thing as transgender. You can't be, you can be a cross-dresser. If you're a pervert, you can be a cross-dresser. But you can't be, you can't be transgender. If you're born a male, you're a male. I don't care what surgery you have. You're still a male. You're just mutilated now. Female's a female. That's just... The way it is, and Jesus taught that in Matthew 19. He answered and said unto them, Have you not read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female? Two genders, that's it. He said, For this cause shall a man leave father and mother, and shall cleave to his wife, and they twain shall be one flesh. Marriage is a man and a woman joined together. It, there's no such thing as same-sex marriage. No such thing as transgender. Quit using their terms. I've seen it with people. I've seen it with people. They water it down, and, and, and the, the devil's world system is working on them because they spend more time listening to the media than they do studying the Word of God. Now, I, I want to try to find a place to close this message. <laughs> I say that in all, look, with the desire that people need to hear the truth. I think it hurts the sodomites more for a preacher to get up and accept their sin. I think it hurts them more. They need to, they need to see themselves lost and sinful in need of a Savior. So the good news is Christ died for all sin. That includes, I mean, every sin that's ever been committed, Christ died on. Can you imagine that? What a Savior. See, God, is, God hates sin, and he's a God of wrath against sin, but he's a God of amazing love who's provided salvation. They can be saved if they'll turn to Christ, trust in Christ in all sincerity. But I, I'm not just picking on that. I'm just saying that the reason why I preach on that is because is that not an issue that they're putting in your face every day now? You can't even watch a commercial. You can't. It's just all over the place, and they're pushing it for a reason. Don't accept it. Reject it. Any preacher so-called like Warnock up there who claims it's, you know, it's not a big deal, it's because he's got another Jesus. These people have another Jesus that's not God. His blood doesn't save. He's inclusive and ecumenical and liberal. That's not the Jesus Christ of this Holy Bible, I can promise you. And I just gave you a few verses. We can stand up here all day <laughs> proving these points. So I'll say in conclusion, we'll pick it up next week. This is going to be a two-parter that... If Satan can't get you to deny the inspiration of the Scripture, you know what he's going to try to do? Deceive you concerning the interpretation. So it's bad enough you got these people out there in religion who don't believe the Bible, and therefore they come up with this fake Jesus that, that, that's totally against the Scripture. But then the next step is to not understand the difference between Jesus and his earthly ministry and from the right hand of the Father glorified in what he revealed for this age of grace. Same Jesus, but a different ministry. 
I heard a guy get up, and I'll close with this. He got up. Somebody asked me, they said, would you watch this uh, video? Uh, somebody asked me to watch it, and uh, I wanted to see what your thoughts are on it. And uh, uh, it's called Enemy Within the, Enemies Within the Church. And I tried to look it up, but apparently you got to buy it. And I don't know if I want to do that or not. But uh, uh, So I got some clips of it, you know. And, and so bottom line is, I looked, immediately I looked in the guy who produced it, what his doctrine is. And it's, it's very messed up doctrine, okay? But he gets up and he's talking about being woke and this agenda of, of the wokeness, you know, how it's crept into the church. And he's railing on that's the enemy within the church, but then his solution is to get up and say we got to get back uh, to the law, the, the, you know, the law of God, and we got to get back to the gospel of the kingdom. And, you know, and he's, and he's just totally out of whack on his doctrine and really that's an enemy of the church because a real church ain't fallen for the woke garbage any church that's having struggles with that it's not a church okay any church of saved people is really i have a hard time thinking they're really struggling with this nonsense that's being promoted but a, a real church is very there's a lot of real churches that don't rightly divide the word of truth and they're in real danger uh, in, in as far as deception and messed up doctrine, that Satan wants to mess up your doctrine. So it starts with believing the Bible, but it doesn't stop there. You got to rightly divide the word of truth. And so there's another Jesus. In terms of most people today talking about Jesus, are still following him in his earthly ministry in the days of his flesh. He's he's not in the days of his flesh any longer. He is the risen, glorified. Son of God, the right hand of the Father, who made divine revelations through Paul for the age of grace. And there's differences there. You got to get that straight. Now, we'll talk about that and then finish up talking about the Antichrist. Because the people who don't receive the true Jesus Christ are going to wind up, when they're left behind, when the Lord comes, they're going to wind up worshiping the Antichrist. That's serious stuff, man. I'm, talking about, I'm just getting to the root of everything here about what's really going on. There's a lot of people talking about Jesus in America today. Which one are you talking about? And you got this unbiblical Jesus, you got the non dispensational Jesus, and we'll talk about that next time, and then the diabolical Jesus as far as what's coming, what Satan is going to, Satan is going to have a, there's going to be a strong delusion come. So thank God. Look, most important thing is to know the true Lord Jesus Christ of the Holy Scriptures and know him as your Savior, know him in a real way, to trust in him, to know him as Savior. And to walk with him and to grow in the knowledge of him. There's nothing more important than that. We're all sinners. We deserve death and hell for our sins. But the Son of God left heaven's glory to come to this earth and go to the old rugged cross where he laid down his life as a sacrifice to bleed and die for the sin of the whole world. And any sinner, no matter who they are and what they've done, if they will trust him as their Savior, he'll take away all their sins. And if you trust Christ, he gives you his righteousness and you're justified in him and sanctified in him and one day you'll be glorified in him. And he is, Paul said, thanks be unto God for his unspeakable gift. Uh, you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor that ye through his poverty might be made rich. What a savior. He's, he's an amazing God of love and, and mercy and grace. But, you know, if you don't receive him, then you got to face the wrath of God. And let's preach the whole truth. Let's stand together, please. All right, we'll be dismissed in just a moment with a word of prayer, but as the piano plays, as always, with the heads bowed, if you just focus here a moment on this question. First of all, are you saved? If you died right now, would you be with the Lord? You can know that you're saved if you'll take God at his word and put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, his finished work. We deserve death and hell for our sins, but Christ died for all our sins. Salvation is a free gift. Quit trying to get saved. Put your trust in him. You'll be saved by grace. Then being saved, are you confident that you're worshiping the Lord Jesus Christ as revealed in the Holy Scriptures? Don't fall for another Jesus. There's a counterfeit out there. I mean, it's rampant. And when you're trying to help people, keep that in mind when they talk about Jesus. You need to ask them some questions to find out which one they're talking about.
you're not sure you're saved, you right now in your heart, wherever you're at, in here, online, wherever you're at, just trust Christ as your Savior. Believe He died for you, rose again. It's finished. It's a free gift. He'll save you the moment you believe. All right, we're going to be dismissed with a word of prayer. I encourage you to stay. We've got all this food. This is like always. You come through this door, buffet style, through the kitchen and come out. Should be enough room in the fellowship, Paul. Uh, so we'll pray, and I'll ask someone to bless the food. And, and uh, please stay and enjoy the time uh, we have together. And uh, so we'll be dismissed uh, with a word of prayer. Father, we thank you, Lord, for the word of God. And, and Lord, we're living in days that it's just, it's really... It's hard to believe the stuff that's going on, but it's a result of getting away from the Word of God. And God, help us to be a light in a dark world and preach, and preach the true Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, God Almighty. Without you, Lord, there's no salvation. You are the Savior, not one of the Saviors, the only Savior, and help us to tell the truth. And also to rightly divide the Word of Truth and understand what you're doing in this age of grace. I thank you for our church and the time we've had in your word and the time of fellowship. And I thank you for the food we're about to receive, those who prepared and, and brought it. And just pray you'll bless. And we ask in Christ.